Hi. This is going to be a video uh, about the reassembly of a potted motor from a Singer Model 101. Uh, the Singer 101 was the first sewing machine Singer ever made to be exclusively electric, so it didn't come in a hand crank model or a treadle model. Um, it had a short run from 1920 to 1932, and only about just over 230,000 of them were made, which is a low number for Singer. Um, and they also were not cheap. They were $140 to $170 back then, which is about $2,000 today. So they're a bit rare nowadays. Um, pretty collectible. People love to have them. Uh, I think they're beautiful, which is the reason that I became a little obsessed and uh, went down the rabbit hole of, of restoring um, one or more. Um, so this is how to reassemble the motor. The disassembly is detailed in a, a post on the Victorian Sweatshop Forum, and I'll post a link to that um, so you can see how to get here. Um, and what I'm going to do is show you preliminarily a few of the things I had to do to get it into shape to be reassembled, and then we'll commence to reassembling. Uh, the two that I have are a 1927 and a 1930. Um, these two motors. Um, there are some subtle differences between them um, that I don't entirely understand necessarily, but I think I do have a good handle on how to get them back into proper working order. Uh, so I'm going to pop you out of your holder here and bring you over this way to see that I've kept, as you can imagine, all the screws and worm gear and parts, etc., organized in bags um, so I know what to do with them and where they go. Um, this is the commutator shaft and that assembly. Um, and of course I had to, the grease cups have these springs in them with felt cores and I had to rewind on the springs and I've left it long so until I figure out exactly what length I want it. Um, uh, the rest of the things were cleaned with degreaser and brushed with oil where appropriate um, with rust removal also if needed. And then there are two sort of fiber washers that go on the commutator shaft. Um, that I was able to preserve for one of the motors and wasn't so lucky with the other and so I figured out how to make some new ones from parts available online um, with a little bit of dremeling by hand. That's the original and these are the just slightly larger in the middle and smaller on the outside um, replacements that I have available um, for anyone who needs them. Um, and so to start out I've got this field core threaded back through the housing here um, and what I had to do before I even started to think about reassembly was to clean these carbon brush boxes. Um, and the way I did that, and you can see it's uh, pretty nice in there. Um, used just a, uh, a wood shim that I'd split down to the right size and some fine grain sandpaper. And then I had to learn how to solder. I hope I did a decent job because these wires were fraying and there was at most two or three of the little wires connected still and so I unsoldered, pulled the, stripped the uh, um, coating back there and then cleaned the wire and then re-soldered them both into, there's a, there's actually a hole that goes through the little brass, the little tab there that you bend the wire through and then solder it. So I did that for both of them. And then on the other end where the lead wires connect to the electrical terminal, they needed new rings. Uh, which I was able to put on there, and I used color-coded shrink wrap tubing, red and black, because that terminal is color-coded, as probably a lot of you have seen, the yellow, a red, and a black port. And so, now I know where those go. And then with the later motor, the 1930 motor, you can see there's a bit of a difference between the two metals of the brush boxes. I'm not exactly sure, and brass is what this looks like, and that's more typically what I've seen these made out of. Not really sure what this is, if it's stainless steel or what, but they both cleaned up nicely, resoldered both of them, of course, and then uh, lead wires with new connecting rings and shrink wrap tubing to color code them so that I know where they go. So that's that, and uh, we're going to go ahead and get started uh, reassembling this motor. Okay, so just before we get into reassembling, uh, I mentioned there were a couple differences between the two motors that I have. This one is the 1927 motor, and this is the 1930, and 
You'd think three years apart there wouldn't be any manufacturing differences, but uh, it looks like there are. Um, just in terms of the way the thing was milled and the, the machining. Um, I mean, this one even has Simanco USA stamped in it, and this one doesn't. Um, and I think some of these things are probably not important, but there are, there's one difference that is a little disappointing and that could be significant to the function of the motor that I'll show you in a second. One thing that, that's interesting that you'll see in a service manual or even in the operation manual for the machine, um, it's interesting that the, the, the operation, the regular operations manual details a little bit of motor maintenance. I mean, the Singer expected, again, this being their first electric only machine, the Singer kind of looks like Singer expected um, owners to actually do some maintenance, which I think is very interesting. Um, but the, the carbon brushes go in either side here on either side of the commutator shaft. And one thing that's mentioned in the manuals is that one side is marked with some brass paint and the other with some aluminum paint. And the brushes themselves apparently were marked similarly with some of this paint or a marking like that uh, somewhere on the brush. Um, some people I've talked to have seen this before. I haven't seen it in either of the sets of brushes that came out of either of these motors. But the idea was that you put the brass side in the brass and the aluminum side in the aluminum. But it, I don't think it really matters in terms of the function of the motor, which brush you put on which side, as long as the curvature of the brush is sort of matched up with the curvature of the commutator shaft. Um, you know, when you buy a brush brand new, it's going to have a flat end, but as it as the it contacts the shaft and the shaft spins, it's going to have develop a curvature, and so it's probably good to match that back up. But as far as putting one on either side, I don't think it really matters. Um, the difference that's bothering me a little bit about these two motors is where the the commutator shaft goes into the motor. Um, there's a couple bushings that hold it, and you can see one sticking out here that goes through the housing. And then there's one in here as well, and the, the shaft spins within these bushings. And through the bushings are holes in the bottom through which go felt wicks on springs, which rest inside these cups that are full of grease. And so the idea is that the felt wick is in there on a spring, um, resting in this cup full of grease as a reservoir, and the motor is... Um, like this in its native state. Um, and that as the motor heats up, the grease or motor lubricant melts slightly and is wicked up this wick into the bushing to lubricate the shaft as it, as it turns. Um, and these holes that are drilled in, in the bottom um, to accommodate the cups and the housing and then drilled actually all the way through the bushing uh, are kind of different sizes in these two housings. I'm gonna get some extra light here so you can see and so you can see that on the left side is the 1927 motor, on the right side is the 1930, that they're markedly different sizes. Um, and the felt cording is pretty much a standard size. I forget what exact diameter it is. Um, but I have some, and when I pulled the, the grease cups and felt cording that was old out of this motor, out of the 1930 motor, they came right out. And here they were really tweaked up in there, which is kind of not the point because they're supposed to be able, they're on a spring and they're supposed to be able to sort of contact the bushing as it, as it, you know, it moves around and there's freedom of movement there. Um, the other thing that, that bothers me a bit is that, so there's a hole through each bushing and you can see the hole inside this bushing there. And that hole is contiguous with the, the hole in the bottom of the motor here. Um, and you can see that in, in this one, the bushing, is, it's a little off. There's a sliver of bushing sticking out there. So the, the bushing itself is sort of not set exactly right in there. And this is the only thing that I haven't done to these motors to, to sort of rehab them that I could do is remove these bushings. The, the, the screw for this bushing is right here and the screw for the inner bushing is here. And you could take these out, use some PB blaster or whatever, get them loosened up and remove the bushings. And then I could reset that that bushing so that the hole was a little more concentric with the outer hole. Um, but my thought is that this motor has been running for a hundred years the way it is and any adjustments to such a, a fundamental piece of it, um, like these bushings and the way the shaft runs through them is going to make things a little off. And since it's so used to have being run in, uh, you can even see marks on the shaft there where they go through the bushing and it's, it's used to fitting the way it's fit for all the time it's been operating. And I think adjusting that 
is likely to produce more chaos and discord for this motor than, than would actually fix it or make it more efficient. So I've left those alone and decided not to do anything um, with removing the bushings. I did trim down so the felt cording, you can see it's thicker in the back. I did trim it down significantly on the end so it does fit up through that hole and it does come up just a little bit inside the bushing where it's supposed to be. Um, so I think I've solved that problem. Uh, but it's just, like I said, the, you know, I, I, my thought, is, all of us who collect these are kind of like, wow, things aren't made the way they used to be. And they were so much better back then. And this is kind of evidence that I think Singer was really still figuring it out with his first like electric only machine with this kind of potted motor design. And over the years, as things, you know, as things went along, the designs changed and probably for the better. And so I think the older ones are certainly more collectible. You know, a first run Singer 101 machine is like, wow, I'd love to have one of those. But um, it, it may easily be that they figured out and solved a few problems along the way, along the run. And so maybe the end of the run is, is a better machine to actually use. Um, it reminds me of uh, my buddy Jim on the Victorian Sweatshop talks about the inverse pretty principle in that a machine that's really kind of run in and, and looks used and worn probably sews a lot better than one that looks pristine that either wasn't used because it didn't sew very well or hasn't been really touched much and hasn't been run in very well. So um, I'm hoping that both of these can be made to work really well once again and so we'll, we'll start reassembling and I'll show you that. All right, so we're gonna get the field core and the motor housing back together. And to do that, we need to re-establish um, the connection with the carbon brush boxes, these, these uh, silvery metal, typically brass um, holders that hold the, the carbon brush and spring against the, the commutator. Um, these are contained within Bakelite sheets on either side. And removal of all of this is really impossible without separating the metal box from the Bakelite sheath which after a hundred years of sitting together, um, they were reluctant to part, um, but some penetrating oil helped with that. And so the, um, the boxes come out inwards and the sheets come out outwards. Um, and the, the reason they can't, um, when they're connected, um, you can't get them in past this central boss here. Uh, that kind of is obstructing any inward progress of the, the Bakelite sheath, and so they need to be separated in order to separate the, the housing from the field core. Um, the sheaths themselves have this notch on one side and the inside, and they have this flat spot milled into them, um, which sits behind this grub screw on either side, and is, which is what holds this in place from being rotated. Um, interestingly, when I took this motor apart, um, these screws were somehow loose, and these um, sheaths had been rotated from a sort of a 90 degree straight um, up and down orientation to a sort of a 45 degree orientation. And that has implications for how the, the brushes wear. Um, I've since uh, smoothed the brushes just a little bit so that they are a little more um, at right angles. You can see the curvature there. It's very slight on the edge of the, the brush that's gonna match up with the curvature of the commutator. It's important to have a good connection there. And so what we're going to do is pop these in here on either side, and then we're going to put the brush holders into those and then screw them down and then get both, ha both halves of this back together. Um, I took pictures, of course, as I was doing this so that I could remember what orientations things belonged in. And I know that you see the tab on the box there, and the tab on this side goes up and the tab on this side goes down. Um, again, I don't know if that has any real implication for how the motor functions, but I'm going to put it back the way I found it because I think that's probably best. And then also, um, knowing where that flat spot is to fit it right behind the grub screw there. Um, I recall from the photos that really it goes in about that far and that's going to, that's the way I found it was just about that much. And so I'm going to put everything back together and uh, get it in shape to, to fit the rest of the motor back together. So I'm gonna put this brush box here into the holder and then 
fit this guy on the other side. He's a little tighter. And get this. It's going to be possibly hard for you to see, but get this holder in there, like that. And then I'm going to get them oriented straight and then in just about as far as I found them so that the flat spot on the big leg sheet matches up with that grub screw that's going to hold it in place nicely. And I'm going to call that good. Maybe not too tight, but tight enough that hopefully I'm going to prevent rotation. And I might actually go through for this one, but we'll see. I'm going to go through the... Sorry, this is going to be tough for you to see. But again, I'm going to pull this guy up in here just to where about it belongs. And then go right through with my screwdriver through the field core and tighten it down. Okay. And then the thing to do is get these back together so that there are no wires obstructing the path of the commutator. So I'm going to pull the main wire out and fit these back together nicely like so. And push wires inwardly out of the way. And get some light in there for you to be able to see. There we are. There's a little wire there. There's a wire there. It's behind the field core. I think I'd rather that orientation, so I'm going to push that wire back behind the field core, and I think we're good to go. And now it's all ready for the commutator shaft to line up for the inside there. And just for fun, I'll show you that. And just Fit right in the center there. Rotate freely without being obstructed. Okay. And then the screws for this one each there, and that'll be back together. So we have the field core connected back to the housing and the carbon brush holders and things in place inside there at right angles to the commutator. The wiring arranged so it's out of the way of everything that's going to be spinning around. And the underneath one of these screws that holds the two halves together is this fantastic label that is only on the 1927 motor. The one on the 1930 motor is either wasn't there or is missing. And it tells you how many volts and how many amps and the catalog number and all that stuff. I think it's really cool. Um, just the, the look of something like this tells me that this is, yeah, this is old. Very neat. Anyhow, and the last thing is uh, tightening this scrub screw here to hold this insulation cowling uh, in place so that it doesn't rotate around. This insulation is old. It's not great. It looks like it's fraying a little, but I think rather than replace it with something else, I'm just going to leave it because I don't think it's uh, going to be harmful. So what to do now is... Get our commutator back in here and come on in there and get the worm gear around it. Get the two grub screws in there and then make sure everything is lined up and in place to be operating and spinning freely. So one of the things I mentioned earlier in the video is that the shaft has these two fiber washers that go around it. These are the originals. And here are the two that I manufactured and I believe are exactly the same thickness and diameter, inner and outer. I'm going to stick with the originals just because they've been there for a hundred years. Why, why change them? And they, they seem to be really nicely intact. They're, they're still pretty stiff and, and not cracked and not broken in any way. And so I'm just going to slide these back on. But first I want to show you something cool, and that is that the tolerances here seem to be pretty tight in, in all around. I mean, the, the shaft in the bushing doesn't have any lateral play that I can feel. Um, 
And one of the things that I was concerned about and took a lot of pictures of before I disassembled everything is how to get it back together the way it, the way it was. And you can see that there's a flat spot in the shaft of the commutator there. I'm rotating it back and forth. And I know that and I, the way this motor goes in to the, the machine is like this. And this is the hand wheel side and this is the needle side. And I've named this side A and this side B. And I've named, I've done, you know, when I labeled my parts and such, I have them all labeled that way so I can keep them straight. So this is the worm gear grub from side B. And so I know that this screw is the one that goes on the worm gear on the right side. And I keep the same grub screws where they belong. And also the important thing, uh, may or may not be important, but I, I want to try to preserve again, just put everything back just the way it was because things were running together like this for a long time. Uh, I know that the flat of the commutator shaft that I showed you rests under the A side screw in this case. Interestingly, in the other motor I have, it rests under the B side screw. But again, I'm going to put both of these back the way they were, the way I found them. And so the thing to do is to get this get the worm gear and the shaft through it in here, get the screws back on with the A side screw through here and the B side screw uh, resting against the shaft, tighten them both down nicely and get it all back together the way it was. An interesting thing is where does this shaft belong along the length here? And one of the ways I assessed that was to use this uh, caliper. And so I probed the depth with the depth probe of the end of the shaft here. You can see I can, you can push it in and out like that. And I found that it was 0.2 inches deep in there. And right now, with this shaft all the way to the right here, this is only 0.18 inches. And that's because these two fiber washers are going to sit on the shaft right up against here and prevent it from going that much farther in. And again, I don't know what the, the function of these are. Maybe somebody can tell me whether it's electrical insulation or lubrication, but they fit exactly perfectly onto the shaft, which is, as I mentioned, nine sixteenths of an inch in diameter. And both of them fit really with like, again, the tolerances, just amazing. Fit up against there nice like that. And so when we put this back now, there again, you can see the flat. Now when I probe the depth of the end of the shaft within this outer bushing here, just over 0.2 inches. So that's where I found it. That's where it's going to be. And so now to get the worm gear around that shaft. I'm gonna pick it up here. And the tolerance here is also stunning. I'll show you. And just push it right through. And there we go. And you can see, I don't know if you can hear this, but it's like a fraction of a millimeter back and forth play. Um, and I'm going to try to, you know, I'll, I'll try to get it in the middle there, whatever the middle is. Uh, but I think it's going to be good to go with some lubrication and, and such. And so there are two, again, screws that go in here. This is the A side and the B side. And the flat of the shaft is going to rest under the A side. And what I'll try to do is show you that it's there now. And as I rotate the worm gear and or the, the shaft, you see it there. You can see how there's shaft, 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 and there's the flat. I think that comes through on the video, I hope. Do it one more time there. You can see it open up there, and there's the flat. And so that's where the side A grub screw is going to go, which I have here. And I'm just going to drop it on there. and try to twirl it in real gently and just get it out. Oh, of course, it fell right in there. Come out. There we go. 
So again, making sure the shaft is, the flat of the shaft is there. And we'll try to get it in. Ah, of course. You're all gonna get to watch me doing this really for the first time. What I can do is, of course, start these ahead of time. And that's probably what I want to do. I've had enough of this. We're going to start them into the worm gear first. And that way I won't have to keep chasing after it when I lose it. So that's going to go right in here. There we go. And may as well get it all the way down to where I can see it coming through so I don't have to turn it too far to get it to tighten down. Of course, now I'm not going to be able to see that flat, am I? I could do one or two things. I could take the screw back out and put the other one in, which is what I'm going to do. And that way you can watch me. Instead of chasing after two of them, I'm just going to chase after one of them. So this guy's going to be in here ahead of time. There we go. And I'm going to tighten it down to where I can almost see it coming through. See that? It's just, you can't, but now you can. Just coming through the, to the edge of the, the inner diameter there. So I'm going to put this on. Put the shaft back through. It's not the right way, is it? There we go. Again, I know which way is the right way because I took pictures before I did anything. Best thing to do. And so we're going to rotate this again. You see the, I hope you can see that there's shiny shaft in there. And then the flat appears. And I'm going to now get, maybe some tweezers will help. Come on, there we go. And actually what I'm gonna do first before I do that is, so I'm seeing that as I turn this, this is real important, as I turn this, the gear is going with the shaft. And so I know that that flat is still aligned with that hole. I want to be able to check it. I'm going to tighten this down just a little bit. And I still see the, the flat there. So I'm going to put this in. All these considerations that you don't even think about until you try to do this. And I think you can tell that I'm doing this for the first time in front of everybody. So it's a little nerve wracking. And this is going to go right in here. There we go. It's going to clamp down into the flat of the shaft. I'm going to loosen this one just to make sure that we're in that flat. And I think that just to check, to double check, I'm going to loosen it just a bit. And as I turn, I can feel. You hear that? That is the flat of the shaft hitting either side of that screw. So I know we're in that flat. So clamp down just a little more. I just want to get it right on there. I'll just unscrew it to be real nerdy. Yep, getting closer and closer to the flat. So there. And so there we are. And so now, now what do I do? I'm going to double check and make sure that all this is sort of in where it's supposed to be. Nothing is too tight in terms of lateral movement. Double check the depth again just to make sure. Again, 0.22 inches, which is where I found it. I'm going to tighten this up 
nicely. And then we're gonna tighten the B side screw. Sorry, there you go. And so now this is in, it's rotating the way it was and it looks the way it did when I took it apart. And so we're all set to finish up by installing the carbon brushes, which are here. And again, you want to make sure that the curvature, which I think you can just see, is there. And so we're going to want that curvature against the side of the commutator. So it's going to go in in that orientation. And then the cap goes on there. And you want to be careful because it'll fly across the room if you don't get it started good. And there it is. And we'll get a nice bit that fits. Screw that on. And that is in. And that's pretty much it for all the parts to this motor. It's now back together. And I'm sure hoping that a test of it is going to reveal that it runs really nicely. Just some final considerations. I you know I said we were all done. We're not really because there's of course these grease tubes to fix and I have new felt wicking wound in the old springs here and the cups themselves that I've shaken down with some grease inside there. Shake it down like a thermometer to get it into the base and I'm just going to put those back together. Um, there is a bit of debate among everyone who likes these sorts of things to as to what kind of grease and what sort of lubricant to use. Um, the old manuals and such would tell you that Singer Motor Lubricant is the thing to use, although that's uh, been in various stages of production over the years and many people who work with these kinds of vintage machines think that the current produced Singer Motor Lubricant is no longer suitable for this kind of felt wicking kind of lubrication of the, the motor shafts and such. And um, most people who have an interest in these sorts of things are advocating for petroleum jelly, etc. And there are some new products out um, made by some folks who claim that the their melting point, etc. is akin to the Singer Motor Lubricant of old. And I not going to weigh in particularly on any one thing to use, whether it's petroleum jelly or old Singer Motor Lubricant or newer Singer Motor Lubricant. Yes, I'm a terrible collector. Don't tell anybody. Um, or the really new Singer Lubricant, which nobody I, I know recommends for these vintage machines. Um, but I think there are some comments that at least can get us thinking about what what is um, appropriate to use. As most people say, oil for points of friction and grease for gears, and so this worm gear and the gear that it engages within the workings of the actual machine need grease, and there is already lubricant in here. I'm not going to comment on what I used, uh, because I think it's, it's really um, up to you what you use for for this purpose, but I think I'm typically a tri-flow kind of person with the Teflon and the grease to go on the gears, although the old Singer literature says the Singer motor lubricant that you're using here is just as good for the gear, so I'm not really sure um, what I'm going to do. I think the one of the big, big comments that's made often is what the melting point is, because as this motor is working and heats up, the idea is that those felt wicks on springs are contacting this shaft in here and the 
the heat of the motor is going to then somewhat liquefy the grease that's in here and cause that to lubricate when necessary and wicking with the wicking of the felt, etc. And I think that the melting point that you need to melt a blob of the grease versus a very thin film of the grease that's wicked up through very tiny capillaries within the felt may be different. Um, and I think that something that stays on this gear is probably a good idea and something that doesn't necessarily melt like petroleum jelly would. And then realizing also that whatever's in here and lubricates the shaft is at some point possibly going to mix with what's on here. So there's a lot of things to think about and I don't have a really great answer for um, what you should or shouldn't use. And lots of people have good recommendations. But I'm just going to sort of use what I think seems best to me. And um, over time, as I maintain this motor and use it, um, make sure that those things are there and that it's well lubricated and that it doesn't overheat. And I think that's the best anybody could really do. Um, so that's it for this. And that's really all back together, all the parts that I had taken apart. Uh, one little bit of advice to say is that when you turn these caps in, um, that hold the carbon brushes within those sheaths, you don't have to torque it. Uh, and I think that's what happened was when I found these at, at different angles is someone replaced the carbon brushes at some point and, and torqued the heck out of this screw and caused them to rotate by 45 degrees or so. Um, so you just have to get it in there so it's not going to rattle out. Uh, and there's not a lot of pressure and things um, on those brushes. So this is turning. I shouldn't really touch that. I know I shouldn't touch the carbon, uh, the uh, the copper wiring. So I'm gonna, you know, you know I'm gonna wipe that off. But there we go. It's uh, turning nice and freely. I'll turn it by the warm gear for you. It seems to go pretty nicely. There's no, I don't feel any grinding, any resistance. Um, and what I'm gonna try to do is is get it working. See what happens. So here we go, all assembled, and I have it wired to power. I'm not going to show that because it's a little jury-rigged and I don't want to inspire negative commentary, but it is safe, and I have this on a insulated mat, and so I have it wired to a standard Singer foot controller, and I'm going to power it up a little bit. is pretty nicely and under load in a machine it's going to be even quieter uh, and I don't think it's going to really go a whole lot faster than what you just saw although I could make it go a lot faster right now without it being under load connected to the actual mechanics of the machine uh, but I'm going to call that good and I'm hoping it's going to work well for us and I'm going to put it back in the machine and hopefully show you that soon. Pretty happy with that.